With Hold It Down, you and Scoop would have been working together six, seven years, probably, I guess. So okay. how had your guys relationship evolved? Were you as close as always? Were you like, how did that go? Because especially in the backdrop of the Hit Squad, Def Squad, EPMD stuff going on at the same time. Well, by Hold It Down, we definitely knew we had to hunker down and, you know, be as tight as we ever at that particular point yeah we we were tight as a crew because we saw what just happened with epmd we saw what was going on with the hit squad and we saw what was going on outside of us like i said you know there are crews popping up left and right from death row bad boy rough riders all these other crews and we just saw our crew fall apart so it made us know we had to stick together so there wasn't any you know Anything other than that, like, God oh, damn, man, the mothership just went down. You know, when you're watching Battlestar Galactica and the big ship and then all these little fighter ships and shit. <laughs> For those who know Battlestar Galactica, Star Wars. How about that, guys? So, you know, it was one of those things. We were like, yo, man, we got to make sure our and same thing with Redman. He was basically he saw what was happening and hence him and. um, Him and. um. Method Man, you know, they linked, you know, I think something was, you know, not as strong between Red and Solo at the time because they were in inseparable, you know, so it was a lot going on, like who, what, how, who, ha, and, you know, but for me and Scoob, yeah, we just knew we had to really make our relationship as tight as possible. We wrote Hold It Down in the same room. You know, you know, we had to go back to the dead serious formula, you know, I, with, with straight up suicide. Shit, I might have been on my bends in my bends, just writing it with some random chick. Hey, hold this, hold this paper for me. I got to get Scoob online. Scoob, did you write your part yet? He's in who knows where. Yeah, I'm getting my part done now. All right, man. Listen, meet me in the studio. All right, later, man. Cool, cool. Thanks. You know, it was one of those, you know, straight up suicide. We're living high, man. We're all over the place. But dead serious. It was one of those. Everybody out the room. Let's get back into the room. That's me and school. And we got to go mess with these producers. Yeah. Oh, you mean hold it down. Hold it down. I mean, hold it down. I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then what uh, what was the rationale or what happened to where you guys went with Parrish per se? For this phase of your career, um, you know we we um we we played that scenario out, and basically how it went down was when we got to the crew, when we got to by the time they discovered us, there was already cracks in their relationship. Mm. They were having their differences, and prior to us coming to the crew, they had just discovered Redman in Jersey at another club. So Red. Basically, him and Eric, they kind of gravitated towards each other. You know, they both did beats. They both, you know, blah, blah, blah. Just personalities click. So I'm not sure of Red's paperwork like that, but I think he was signed to both of them on paper. But more so to Eric. It was, you know, it's funny stuff. So by the time we came in, and I want to say that story is actually applicable to Solo. He was more or less with both of them. Redman was more so signed to Eric. And then once we came in, we were kind of just shuffled over to Parrish's side. Like, all right, these guys are your guys. You know what I mean? It yeah. was one of those. They knew what they were doing, how they were divvying up the talent. And it's not like, because trust me, we didn't, we didn't have a say we didn't like one better over the other. We barely even know these damn guys. You know what I'm saying? Shit, we just dropped out of school, man. We're trying to fucking, we're running from that, you know? So, yeah, people think, oh, we were cooler with Paris and Eric. No, it was just one of those, hey, man, so what's going on? You guys are breaking up, so what's next? Paris was like, well, you know, they're forming the death squad. They are? All right, so what are we doing? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's one of those. Gotcha. Because I will say the uh, I had the the benefit 
uh, as you know, I'm from Maryland, so I got to see you mm-hmm. guys at the uh, the Business Never Personal Tour. Well, it was the 92 tour at the Capitol Center in Landover, Maryland. I got to see that was one of the last shows of the whole uh, the whole crew. So OK, OK. That was a, a beautiful thing to experience because it was like literally a couple of months after that, it was over. It so. was over. Yeah, I believe it. And um, yeah, I got the word too. We were up in Parrish's, you know, room after one of the many shows. And, you know, I'm thinking we're just going to go for another smoke session. And, um, you know, he holds up a poster and, you know, he holds up the EPMD poster and he puts his hand over the E and he's like, you know, guys, from now on, this is what it is. And I'm oblivious. I'm like, hey, man, move your hand from the E, man. I can't see the poster. What are you trying to tell me? And he's like, that's what I'm trying to tell you. From now on, it's PMD. I'm like, what? What did he say? What? what? What's going on here? So it's literally one of those things. And then after we left the room, Scoob and I had our own, like, what the fuck just happened? Because we were literally writing on Everything was going so good, dropped out, platinum. We're like, man, who's writing this movie? This is, who's writing this stuff? And literally, he tells us this. We're like, man, who's writing this shit? This is fucking crazy. You know, we're, we're here now. We're going here. So, and then our crew around us started pointing out stuff to us. Like, yo, man, I don't think these guys are as close as you think. And I'm like, get out of here. And then certain things, watch this guy over here. Watch how he interacts with that guy. I told you, see? So we were starting to now look at everything around us like, these guys don't really fuck with each other. I mean, you know, Parrish got 10 guys. Eric has 10 guys. Solo has five guys. Red has seven guys. We have our seven guys. So we're all just now looking at each other like, oh, shoot. You know, Murray, Keith Murray's in the mix. You know, so we're, we're thinking we're all, you know, doing the AB. We're thinking we're all kumbaya, you know, but far from it. We're like, oh, shoot, everybody is up in here on their own agenda. And that's kind of where shit started setting in, like, okay, hmm. this this sucks. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know? that was definitely one of the, obviously from the outside looking in, that was one of the more heartbreaking breakups to me. Of course, of course. Ever. Me too, bro. Me too. <laughs> yeah. So with, Me too. but around this time too, I thought it was interesting because people were doing a lot of appearances in this 95 era and you guys, you know, Karis one and Hurricane G and then a little bit later, Chub Rock and all this different stuff. What made you guys not do as many outside the uh, hit squad appearances and then start doing a few more a little bit later? I think um, ignorance And the reason why I say that is because there was a time in hip hop when, you know, you're you're so white hot, you're mysterious and, you know, you don't really collab and shit like that, you know. So I think um, just coming off of there was this thing where you do an album, you go out, promote it, do what you do, but then you go disappear. You know, you're you know, it's not social media time like that where, hey, look what I'm having for breakfast or someone just took took a shot with me. And they're like, oh, hashtag dots effects. Hey, it's mysterious. If you happen to see a guy, you're like, I can't believe I just saw, you know, an artist. So it's one of those things where, you know, you're not as accessible to a lot of people, you know, and um, which I thought which I think was a mistake. Um. Because uh, if we didn't do this song with KRS-One, then 20-something, 30 years later, we wouldn't have been asked to come do verses, you know, or et cetera, all the perks, you know, even from pub, like, you know, you're like, oh, man, I did all these songs. I eat the locks. I watch their verses. I'm like, damn, they did all these songs. Their pub must be crazy. Look at all these features they did. Mariah, the this, the that, you know. So that that is one of my regrets. And so... The other part was just being in conflict with a lot of people because we felt they bit our style. So we're not going to do a song with Lords of the Underground. We're not going to do a song with Funk Dubious. We're not going to, you know, so we're not going to do a song with Common. You know, these were guys on our hit list like, these guys are totally biting our shit, ripping our shit off. We're not fucking with them. You know, we're not going to do a song with nobody from uh so so deaf we hate crisscross and jermaine dupree you know so we had 
we're not doing so with you, 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 you know, one of those, <clears throat> you know, and um, it's no different than what I think T-Pain went through, you know, shit like that, where we, he felt like everybody was ripping his style apart and thinking he couldn't do it without auto tune. So, you know, we had a lot of that. And when you're twenties in your twenties, your bank account is overflowing with money. You think you got F you money. You're like, F me. No, F you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't need you. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Now it's, 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 uh, I haven't lived that, but I can only imagine it's a amazing and wild, uh, mind game that goes on. It is, and the, and and the cycle continues before I let you go, Soren, which I see happening because there's no reason, and I give this example. There's no reason Nicki Minaj and and um, what's her name, Cardi B, should be beefing. What the f- are you beefing about? Get on the damn record together. Go. <laughs> you know yes. what I'm saying? Trust me. In 20 years, you'll be like, thanks, Dre. Go. You know what right. I'm saying? There's no reason why Nikki and Lil Kim didn't do a record. Are you serious? There's no reason why Lil Kim and Foxy didn't do a record. Are you serious? So all these things in hip hop and I just see the cycle continuing and continuing like, all right, you know, because when you're young and dumb and getting F you money, you're like, man, I don't need you. You don't need me. Same thing with us. Back to there's no reason why we never did a song with Redman or had a beat produced by Eric or so on and so forth, you know. Well, hopefully that will be coming one day then. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> All right. Well, Dre, before you go, I know you got podcasts. I know you got uh, other businesses and stuff. What mm-hmm. what should people be looking out for right now for you? Um, For me, man, I'm, yeah, I got my podcast. It's called The Producers Podcast, where I, um, I'm interviewing producers. And the reason why I started that is because as an artist, I've always been one of those. If I hear a song, I'm like, who did that beat? Who did that beat? Who did that beat? And a lot of these guys just go, you know, nameless and faceless. So I wanted to give them shine. And, you know, guys like D. Moet, who did Hate Me Now, people don't even have a clue. You know, guys like Easy LP, who did all these records and people don't have a clue. So for me, it was one of those. It was just done out of myself wanting to give light because like I said, I'm always like, who did that beat? And that sucks. You could be standing next to the guy who did clap, who did put your hands where my eyes can see. And you're like, I have no idea who I know Jess West. Okay. I know Jess West. And I had no idea he did step into the world to, into a world for Karis one. So that's how bad it was. And me and Jess were like this at one point. So I got that going on the producers podcast. I'd appreciate it. If you're, you know, your listeners and viewers could check that out. And I also have my own weed line. It's called Googly Goo. This thing will put you to sleep. You know, it's some high grade stuff. And, um, you know, we um, I partnered with a guy in D.C. He's a good guy. My guy, Jeremy. And right now it's, you know, exclusive to the D.C. dispensary. But we're working on some things where we're trying to get it out to your neck of the woods and the Denver, Colorado's of the world and Vegas. So I got that going on and, you know, a few other ventures that before they get off the ground, I'm just going to, you know, not speak about them, but those are my two babies right now. All right. Well, there it is. Well, man, Dre, thank you as always. It's great chopping it up with you as always, man. So thank you. you already know it. Thank you, Soren. Congratulations on everything you got going on. Talk to you soon. Yes, sir. In the beginning, hip-hop was ruled by the East Coast. Then the West Coast rose to prominence, thanks to gangster rap. Hip-hop changed the world. Gangster rap changed the narrative. And then changed the world again. The history of gangster rap features unheard stories, unseen photos and documents, all with exclusive interviews from the founders and players who shape gangster rap. I think a real gangster rapper has to scare you a little bit. The history of gangster rap written by veteran rap journalist Soren Baker. In stores now. Yo, what up? This is DJ Quick. Be sure to pick up my homeboy Soren Baker's book, The History of Gangster Rap, if you really want to know what we do.